You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 15, 2022, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, food allergies. Our presenter is Dr. Sarah Ann Burry. She's the Director of Clinical Trials of the Food Allergy Program in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. Sure. And whenever that goes. Yeah. And we can just go ahead and skip over this because I'll just go through each one of these. It'll have And we can go to the next slide, please. All right, perfect. So um, real quick, we all know what a food allergy looks like, but just to be more specific about the definition of this, it's definitely an abnormal immune response that always occurs reproducibly on exposure to a food. And so there is the need for a sensitizing event so that the immune system knows to make IgE specifically to it, or if there's a different mechanism, that there should be some sensitizing event. And if you click um, again, the next bullet will come up, and this is now the definition of food sensitivity. So the sensitivity of foods, if we go back to the previous slide, is just the presence of IgE antibodies to a food, but in the absence of clinical symptoms. So keep in mind that that's why we always say do not order um, large, broad food panels in someone without any clinical history because you may get false positives, um, especially in patients who have even uh, eczema or have environmental allergies, there's cross-reactivity. And I'll talk about that a little later. Going to the next slide, we can see that there's um, the overall prevalence of different types of common food allergens in both children and adult. And this was uh, most recently published in 2018 and 2019 from the prior 2011-2009 guidelines or um, data set. So we could see overall that what we're seeing from before to currently, we're seeing a gradual rise in food allergies. And overall, there's about an 8% prevalence of food allergies in children with about 11% in adults and 5% of those being adult onset. So we can have food allergies develop de novo in adulthood where they've tolerated it before. Next slide, please. And so when we look at the overall adverse food reactions, we want to categorize and remember that there's immune mediated and non immune mediated. And if you go ahead and click a button, you'll see the kind of focus here on this talk is immune mediated, but more specifically on the very first box on the bottom left, that's IgE mediated. Um, But we have various different types of other immune mediated uh, food allergies. And then to the far right, we can see the non immune mediated. So keep in mind that there could be someone who has lactose intolerance. or scromboid poisoning, or even just idiopathic, maybe due to the sulfites or even caffeine effects that could mimic something that looks like a food allergy reaction. Going to the next slide, this is more of just a comprehensive review of the overall process of like how um, a food allergic reaction kind of starts and finishes. So what we do see is that the allergen is picked up by the antigen presenting cell that then moves into the presentation to um, the T cell, which then it can go in one of two directions where it can activate B cells to produce IgE or it can go in the other direction and produce eosinophils or even other mechanisms of non-IgE mediated processes. But the point of today's talk is going to be a lot on the IgE mediated process so that when the allergen comes back in contact with the IgE that's bound to the mast cell, um, that in itself will activate the um, mast cell basophil to release the tryptase as well as the histamine and other mediators that cause the allergic reaction response. Go to the next slide. Um, We are going to see that there currently are not um, treatments per se yet, except for there is one treatment I'll talk about at the very end, but avoidance is the main way to prevent a food allergy reaction. And epinephrine is really the only way to treat a severe reaction when it presents. And if you click the buttons, you'll see the next couple of um, bullet points. We do know the food immunotherapy trials that are ongoing and some that have already come to fruition and have been FDA approved. And if you click the next button, we do have the oral peanut immunotherapy that's been approved since 2020. So 
treatments, um, excuse me, the signs and symptoms of a food allergic reaction, if you click the next slide, um, we'll see that uh, symptoms always begin within relatively 30 minutes or less, but we usually say within two hours if someone presents for an IgE type of reaction. Um, and this like will present with patients having hives or swelling or respiratory symptoms or even immediate vomiting within those few minutes of ingestion. But keep in mind that you want to also hear if this is repetitive with the subsequent re-exposure of that food. Next slide, please. And just to keep in mind, when you want to treat anaphylaxis, the first line treatment, of course, is going to be the use of adrenaline or epinephrine. And in the IM, injectable form is the, the recommended form. But keep in mind that anyone who has anaphylaxis, it could be defined as one of three things. So here in this first box, we see someone who has sudden involvement of skin mucosal tissue or both. So two organ systems being affected can be defined as anaphylaxis. So if you have hives and respiratory, like upper respiratory symptoms, that by definition is anaphylaxis or vomiting and, and generalized hives or swelling, that by definition too is also anaphylaxis. If you click the next button, you can see that um, if someone has, um, again, we just described the sudden skin mucosal symptoms along with another um, uh, organ system involved like respiratory, gastrointestinal, then that by definition is anaphylaxis, but a sudden reduced blood pressure that we commonly are aware of is going to be anaphylaxis by itself or even sudden respiratory compromise. Um, that too is also anaphylaxis on its own. And then the last um, button is just keeping in mind about reduced blood pressures being by itself. You want to make sure being in the pediatric setting, a uh, systolic blood pressure that drops by 30% or more from the baseline is considered a significant drop in blood pressure. So that's something to keep in mind from that perspective. So how do we go about the evaluation of food allergies? So if we go two more slides, we want to always make sure that we obtain the reaction details. So so you're going to kind of click a couple of buttons here, Salman, just to um, go through all of this. Um, we always want to make sure we uh, understand the specific a suspected food trigger. Ask what specific food was consumed and um, that way we can kind of start building from that history and what exactly are the symptoms that occurred and how soon after that exposure did that symptom present. So really getting the definition of the minutes to hours and was there um, re-exposure and did those symptoms present similarly on that re-exposure. It's important to also ask about cofactors because you might have someone who has exercise induced anaphylaxis and they may have episodes that occur only when eating that food and then subsequently exercising. So that's something to remind yourself that, well, if they eat wheat in just sort of a baseline state, but then they consume wheat and then go and exercise and have symptoms, then there is that effect that, you know, puts them in that category. But then also ask about NSAID use or was there a concurrent illness that, may have presented with or without fever or even stress, just because stress and uh, chronic urticaria may, you know, sometimes go hand in hand and you may have presentation of hives that the patient may be mistaking for the food itself. And more importantly is, did you um, provide treatment when you experience those symptoms? And if so, was it done at home or at a uh, local emergency or urgent care? And you want to find out, did they give epinephrine? Did they give antihistamines or did they give um, steroids? So these are kind of the main treatments you want to ask about and kind of jog their memory and see if they did provide any of these at home. And how long did it take for the symptoms to resolve? Because if your symptoms continue to persist for like over 24 hours after the ingestion, of the food, then we're starting to question like, maybe this isn't due to the food. Maybe this is something else. But more importantly too, after that, you want to know, did they have a biphasic reaction? And that can typically happen one to four hours after the ingestion of the sudden um, pres presentation of symptoms. And more importantly, do they have to avoid other foods because of a known allergy? Next slide, please. So that leads us to kind of asking too about other atopy and seeing if they have a history of atopic dermatitis, asthma, allergic rhinitis, and even EOE. 
asking if there is any history of this, any family history of this is also important. Um, when you press the next button, you'll see kind of the details that you want to continue asking about the food allergy evaluation and the social history, um, as well as asking about the details of how this is impacting their life, you know, in terms of doing things and are they taking any other medications concurrently that could put them potentially at high risk of having a reaction or blunting that effect potentially making it a more delayed um, presentation so these are things to be asking during a food allergy evaluation and you can kind of keep going through the buttons um, to the next slide please and for physical exam, we all know just you can kind of go through these buttons here, but really double check to see is the weight and height appropriate for this patient because most patients, especially those who are milk and egg allergic, may have slow weight gain and kind of slower um, growth velocity. Also look to see if they, the parent or the patient looks anxious. Could be, that's a, a key indicator that we probably need to implement a referral to psychology because there is some benefit from having a psychologist intervene and in helping with the anxiety that may not be present in the child yet, but present in the, in the parent that could then subsequently you know, impact the child later on as they grow up. And really trying to emphasize that there is this need for, you know, um, having the child feel empowered and knowing about their allergies and not being afraid, but being able to speak for themselves. Um, but the rest of the physical exam is also important, as you can see list listed here, but not obviously specific to the actual food allergy, but just to show that there is evidence of ATP. Next slide, please. So how do we manage anaphylaxis? Um, well, we next slide, you'll see the overall kind of algorithm that has um, been published previously by the Academy. And it just really kind of goes through your ABCs um, of, you know, looking at making sure the airway is accessible, the patient is breathing and, and there's good circulation. And really the goal here is to get intramuscular epinephrine into the outer thigh. And really the other steps are gonna start to come through, but it's also important that when there is um, a use of epinephrine, that there should be an activation of the emergency response system so that the patient can have um, the observation period start at an emergency center or an urgent care center for um, watching for that biphasic reaction. Going to the next slide, please. So we've said first line treatment is epinephrine. And what's really important here, and we've really looked to make sure that, you know, throughout our hospital system, um, we have this in place that we're not using intravenous um, epinephrine, which is actually a one to 10,000 concentration. And so, you know, we know the crash carts contain the IV epinephrine so that when someone does go into shock and um, needs uh, cardio, rest, cardio um, support, that IV can be started and it's titrated accordingly, but for the first line treatment, it's IM at the concentration of one to 1,000. And what's important is that the reason we do intramuscular is just because of that quicker peak serum level that can be uh, attained uh, as opposed to subcutaneous. Um, and then again, just to reiterate, anterolateral thigh, just because of the muscular system there is highly vascular. And so it can actually um, be systemically distributed appropriately. And um, you can always repeat the dose um, five minutes after the first dose is given if the symptoms are not improving. So for the next slide, the second line treatments, we always find that sometimes patients will administer diphenhydramine alone when it clearly is an anaphylactic episode. And that's why it's really important to emphasize to them that they need to follow their food allergy anaphylaxis plan so that they're familiar with it and they're not afraid to use the epi and being able to kind of illustrate for them that the dose of the Benadryl, excuse me, or the diphenhydramine that needs to be administered is according to the patient's weight. So our rule of thumb here is that for every 10 kilos of a child's weight or 22 pounds, we typically recommend a teaspoon of diphenhydramine with a max dose of 50 milligrams. And really this should only be used for mild reactions. And the rule of thumb that I share with all of my patients is if it's beyond the skin, epi goes in. Next slide, please. And again, um, kind of 
emphasis of the H1 antihistamines, diphenhydramine, keep in mind, is short acting. It's also sedative. Um, so the patient may start to get really drowsy. And then we're kind of having this sort of really gray zone of knowing is this patient drowsy from the medication or are we starting to lose kind of like we're starting to show signs of lethargy and blood pressures um, dropping. So we, we do typically in our clinic, we administer cetirizine because it's long acting. It has less um, of a sedative effect and it works just as fast as ben uh, diphenhydramine does. But keep in mind, overall, antihistamines are second line treatment. They should never be used as first line, um, mainly because of the slower onset. It's typically peaks at 30 minutes and it can help with cutaneous symptoms, but it really doesn't have any effect on blood pressure or very little effect on the blood pressure. And so um, one should also remember that it's not there to be used to prevent biphasic anaphylaxis. And if you um, click again, H2 antihistamines, on the other hand, um, may be able to actually help in the treatment of the cutaneous symptoms. So using famotidine orally or intravenously uh, is one thing to consider. And using inhaled beta-2 agonists, um, such as albuterol, for bronchospasm may be helpful, especially when epinephrine's already been given. So that might be something to add on. And steroids are also something that we could add on, but again, there's a slower onset of action of about one to two hours. It doesn't work immediately. And keep in mind that it doesn't necessarily um, prevent a biphasic reaction. So it shouldn't be kind of kept in that mindset, um, but can be used, but it's not always useful. And our observation, um, uh, time should always be at least four hours from symptom resolution. So um, if you click the next buttons, you'll start to see that most studies show that symptoms actually can occur in up to 20% of cases, um, meaning that you may see this biphasic reaction. And those biphasic reactions may actually be more severe than the initial reaction. And just remember, antihistamines and glucocorticoids are not reliable for preventing these um, biphasic reactions. Um, but also, there have been reports of biphasic very rarely, um, could happen 72 hours. But that is extremely rare. And it was like a very random case report that was presented. Just keep in mind, most biphasic reactions occur within about one to four hours from the initial reaction. And that's why we say observing them for at least four hours um, once the symptoms resolve is the best way to go. And you might need to observe them for a little longer if they've received more than one epinephrine or if the patient has asthma. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So again, it's definitely indicated that a patient should always have a prescription of self-injectable epi um, because of their prior history of a reaction and the potential that the next reaction could be the same or severe, more severe. Or even when there's perceived high risk, even though we you know, find that there are some patients who start to have... Um, we're not 100% sure, but there is some suspicion based on testing that just happened to be presented to us. We still find that giving them an EpiPen to be on the safer side until we can do an oral challenge to confirm whether or not that is a true allergy or not. We never let someone go home and tell them to introduce a food if there is no history of prior ingestion, but there's a positive test absolutely never introduce at home. They should come to the clinic in order to undergo a challenge. And just keep in mind that there are commercially available self-injectable epinephrine and, um, auto injectors. Um, there's one that's at the very smallest dose of 0.1 milligrams that's specific for infants, but we classically have had the 0.15 uh, milligram intramuscular dose and the 0.3 milligram muscular dose, uh, intramuscular dose. I classically will always um, have the patient switch from the junior version to the adult dosing of the 0.3 once they've reached 25 kilograms, um, because if they're 25 kilograms or a little bit more, but still under 30 kilograms when they come in for their visit, I know that by the next time I see them, they're going to have um, gain some weight. So I don't want them to be walking around with the junior dose of 0 0.15 and always have prescription of two doses. So a pack for home and a pack for school, because you don't want them to separate those um, twin packs um, because they could need that second dose within five minutes of the first dose. And just education is key that you want them to understand that they need to avoid strictly, they need to have special um, plans at school in place. And that way it allows them to have the appropriate meal plans if they're, unless they're bringing their food to school, 
And then also how to manage going on vacation or going out to eat at restaurants and having a medical alert bracelet would be very useful in case someone who is familiar with the patient isn't there and someone else is trying to manage them. And if you click the next button, we also know that um, treatment of a reaction, it's important to make sure that they have an updated emergency action plan and that they um, are familiar with it, that they have an EpiPen and they also have um, a medical identification um, jewelry that they can wear every day. Next slide, please. And just here is just what a standard food action plan is, which all of you guys I know have um, at your site. So testing and diagnosis. Next slide, please. What we know is that as I've mentioned at the very beginning, we do not want to order broad screening panels without a supporting history. The reason is that there's a risk of a false positive rate um, for food testing. And um, this positive predictive value is actually less than 50% in someone who tests positive with no prior history of reactivity. So it's really important that we don't just randomly have screening panels ordered on folks. And this is commonly usually seen from the general pediatric side. Skin prick testing is important to do with a commercial extract, but you can use fresh fruit or vegetables to do prick to prick testing if we're not seeing any response from the extract itself. And that just allows for more protein to be in, um, scratched onto the skin. And then we also do in vitro food specific IG testing as well as with the components if those components are available. Next slide, please. So just to kind of overview of what immediate hypersensitivity skin testing looks like, you can see the little wheels that develop on the skin after the extract is kind of punctured through the epicutaneous layer. It's a very rapid test, 15 minutes to show a response. Um, it do does detect sensitivity to the specific food antigen, but keep in mind, it cannot tell you the type of reaction you're gonna have. So when someone says, oh, well, a 14 millimeter, does that mean my child's gonna have a severe anaphylactic episode? The answer to that is it only predicts a reaction will happen, but not the type of reaction. And so the intradermal testing is something that we may see with like venoms and with other types of allergens, but we do not recommend it for food testing. So do not do any intradermal testing for foods, um, mainly because of the risk of systemic reactions, and you also have a higher false positive rate. And finally, there's clearly a strong correlation between the wheel size and the likelihood of clinical reaction, but it cannot predict the severity of the reaction. Next slide, please. And if you can click one more time, this is just an overall view of how the immunocap testing works. And what we can see in the middle box top portion, sorry, starting from the top portion, we have the allergens coupled to the bottom of the substrate and the patient's IgE then comes in contact with those substrates. And then in that process of incubation, then they can add a conjugate enzyme that's an, that is against the IgE. Um, so it's an anti-IgE antibody to the patient's antibody. And then by the next step, they add a fluorogenic substrate, which then allows for the reaction to be then detected through the machine so that it can tell us the degree of that um, concentration of the patient's IgE detectable against the allergen. So when we do skin testing and food allergies, um, again, we've said there's a good negative predictive value that's over 95%, but the positive predictive value is much less and below 50%. And so remember, positive skin test does not equate to having a true food allergy. And so one will help understand that skin testing, um, sorry, history is gonna help us delineate between someone who's sensitized versus having a true allergy. Next slide, please. So what are the limitations of skin testing in evaluation of someone with a food allergy or food hypersensitivity? Well, age. If we have a young infant, um, there is a lower cutaneous histamine reactivity in those children who are less than two, as well as a lower IgE reactivity that would be detected on um, the blood work. But that doesn't mean one shouldn't do it. It's still just that keep in mind that the wheel size may be smaller. And when you repeat it again in a year or two, it might actually get larger. And that shouldn't throw the parent off to think like, oh gosh, this allergy is becoming worse now. It's more like, well, 
we're able to only detect so much when they're so little. And as they get older, we may start to see the wheel size get larger just because of the IgE that they can produce. Um, and keep in mind the discontinuation of antihistamine is necessary um, based on the half-life of the drug. And you want to avoid um, a drug for five half-lives in order to do skin testing. And that might be difficult for someone with eczema or, or um, chronic urticaria. And also it requires a clean skin surface. So you may also want to hold off on someone who has active eczema present on their skin where the um, actual testing will be performed. The next slide, please, will uh, show us the kind of predictive value levels um, by blood that tells us that there's a risk of a reaction in a patient to a specific food. So we can see that for egg, we have patients who are two or under an IgE value of two or less, uh, sorry, two or more has a 95% predictive value. And an infant who is less than or equal to two years of age only needs an IgE level of five or more for milk to have a 95% positive predictive value. And we can see that the other values are pretty much um, going to be sort of stable with predictive values pretty high for peanut and fish and even tree nuts, but less predictive with soy and wheat allergy. Um, you can click the next slide to the next slide. And even again, just to reiterate that with the um, food allergens, we have various levels, but even for skin testing, we can appreciate that someone who has an egg white of three millimeters or less will have a good chance of potentially passing a food challenge as well as for peanut. Um, but keep in mind that if no one has ever had an exposure to peanut, if their IgE is two or less, then um, excuse me, if their IgE is five or less and they've had never had an exposure to peanut, then they may actually have a 50% chance of passing that food challenge. Whereas if they've had a prior reaction and now the IgE is two or less, there is a chance that they could also pass their food challenge. So moving on to the next slide, um, speaking of peanut, we can see that there are multiple different components now being discovered for the different um, peanut allergens. And there are about 18 so far to date. And we can appreciate this nice circle here that's color-coded. And this actually came from the most recent IACI uh, Molecular Allergology 2.0 500 page um, booklet that has like all of the different types of allergens that are known to us in the field and what are the common um, uh, allergens and components associated with higher risk. Going to the image on the right, far right hand side, Going all the way to the very end, we can appreciate that if someone has detectable error H1, 2, 6, 7, and 3, these are stable proteins, meaning they are not able to be degraded by heat, and there are storage proteins that have an increased risk of putting the patient in having severe symptoms or an anaphylactic reaction if they were exposed to the peanut with these detectable components um, as seen in their blood work. So keep in mind that um, when you see someone with an error H5 or an error H8, and that's the only type of component that they have present in peanut, then one should probably go ahead and have them come to the clinic to undergo an oral food challenge to the peanut because there's a good chance they may be able to pass the challenge. Next slide, please. And this is a really great table here that really summarizes the different food allergens on the far left, their components in the second column, and the components um, and how those components are clinically relevant in the diagnosis of someone with a food allergy or even a venom allergy, as well as other environmental allergies. Keep in mind, again, the era H2 is one of the most common predictors of a severe allergic reaction to peanut, but we can also appreciate in wheat, for example, the um, the omega-5 gliadin also is significant if present in high amounts that it would potentially put someone at risk for an anaphylactic reaction. And this picture here on the next slide, we can see that there is cross, um, if you can go to the next slide, thank you. The cross reactivities that exist between food allergens. Um, so if someone is say allergic to cow's milk, they have a 92% um, chance of also reacting to goat goat's milk, but there's only like a 4% reactivity if they were to drink and consume a horse or mare's milk. 
and only 10% reactivity to hamburger beef if they're milk allergic. So this is a very useful table to kind of provide. And I use this very commonly when patients are asking me about certain foods um, and even fruits and vegetables, if there's any particular um, cross reactivity. And I show them this table so that they can kind of feel a little bit more assured knowing what's safe and what may not be safe to consume. And on the next slide, we have what's known as oral pollen allergy syndrome. And this is the phenomenon that the patient who might be allergic to a pollen in, say, birch um, pollen or ragweed pollen or any one of these uh, environmental pollens here, if the IgE happens to be specific for a epitope on that pollen, there is this cross-reactivity effect that can be present in, as well in detectable in the other fruits and vegetables as well as nuts. And so an example here is in birch pollen, Bet B1, for example, is also going to be a, an epitope or a uh, peptide that is present in a lot of these fruits and nuts and vegetables listed here next to birch. So, and what's known about this is that if you heat the food, that protein actually can move from its conformational form um, to a more linear form so that the IgE is no longer detectable when they consume, say, an apple in a cooked version or a cherry in a cooked version. But when they're eating it or consuming it raw, they may experience oral symptoms um, or itching and swelling of the lip or tongue. And maybe even in severe cases in less than 10%, those patients may potentially experience anaphylaxis. But I never really give all of my oral allergy patients EpiPens. Only if they've told me that they've had throat tightening um, is when I would suggest that they carry an EpiPen in that scenario. So the next slide is looking at the overall resolution of food allergies. And we can see that in about 50% of kids, they may outgrow their milk allergy by 10. And in almost just under 50%, they may outgrow their soy allergy by the time they're six. And again, about 50% may outgrow their egg allergy by the time they're about six as well. But peanut allergy is typically seen a res a resolution of this is only occurring in about 20% of in, uh, children by the age of five. But there's some variability in adults. But again, I think it's still relative to say that 20% um, resolution may still be present beyond the age of five, but most of the cases are persistent when they're um, older. And on the next slide, what we can appreciate too is that in order to know if someone has actually outgrown their food allergy is to perform the oral food challenge. And so we have different types of oral food challenges where we give the dose every 15 to 30 minutes and you can do an open challenge or single blinded challenge where only the patient is blinded and so they don't know what they're receiving. And then a double blinded placebo controlled food challenge. And those typically will occur on separate days, not on the same day. And then on the next slide, we can appreciate with the um, latest practice parameter on doing food challenges, the top um, left um, food challenge algorithm shows that this is what's known as the Practal uh, food challenge um, protocol for patients who are undergoing research protocols. So this is what's commonly used in order to get a patient up to three grams of the protein uh, of for the food in question. Whereas the bottom right-hand box, we'll see that in clinical, practical clinical settings, we may consider just doing a four-dose protocol or even a six-dose protocol. But keep in mind that the doses should be administered every 15 to 20 minutes, and there should be an observation of up to two hours after the last dose. Next slide, please. And so we go on to the next slide for treatments of IgE-mediated food allergies. And what we always want to keep in mind is, well, what's the focus of the treatment? Are we trying to do primary prevention, which is preventing any IgE sensitization and food allergy? Or is there secondary prevention, like we saw with the LEAP study, where the, the infants had IgE sensitization because of their eczema and their ATP history, but were able to de prevent the development of food allergy by giving the food regularly um, um, in that course of time, or tertiary prevention, the patient already has the allergy um, and we're doing a treatment such as immunotherapy. Next slide, please. And so just to reiterate about the NIAID guidelines on someone who has a peanut allergy, 
ordering testing is considered necessary for someone who has a history of severe eczema or an egg allergy or both. And in the case of someone who is being seen in the pediatric clinic, getting a specific IgE may be useful so that if it is negative, then the patient can actually go on and introduce at home. Or if they're afraid to do it at home, they can just do a supervised feeding in the office. But if the skin test or blood test, excuse me, is positive, then you want to refer to a specialist in order to undergo skin testing. Because once skin testing is performed by the allergist, anyone who's at a range of three to seven millimeters on the wheel size would be offered a supervised feeding in the office, um, which then could be in the form of a graded oral challenge. Um, so those are things that we do still offer, but anyone who's eight millimeters or higher would likely be allergic in the infant stage of life and even older as they, um, you know, have this positive skin test finding. Next slide, please. So again, if we find ourselves having a patient with food allergy, we potentially will want to offer them immunotherapy for that particular food if it's available. And that whole goal of immunotherapy is to actually increase their threshold of reaction to the food. So let's say they reacted to 10 milligrams and had a pretty significant reaction of the peanut protein. Well, doing peanut immunotherapy could potentially bring them up to like 300 milligrams or even higher so that the accidental exposures don't necessarily cause a severe reaction or potentially any reaction at all. And so keep in mind, this is not a cure. And that's what I always tell families when they are asking about doing immunotherapy. It's desensitization, giving the allergen daily and escalating that dose to the maintenance dose every two to four weeks. And this prevents the immune system from becoming reactive as the doses continue to increase um, every Every month or so. And the next um, is knowing this term sustained unresponsiveness. It's not that the patient is fully tolerant because if you take the food away, there's a chance that they could become reactive after undergoing immunotherapy. But if sustained unresponsive is the absence of reactivity to an allergen. Next slide. And I think um, we can kind of go through this slide just to show the different types of immunotherapy. If you click one more time, you'll see also slit listed here. Um, so this is very useful just to kind of see. And then the next slide will show um, the um, kind of escalation of how immunotherapy works um, for oral versus epicutaneous. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, we have the just final summary points. And so um, with that, I'm going to kind of stop here and leave this to you guys to read um, at your own leisure. But um, really the take home point here is that the food allergies are on the rise and we do want to make sure that we are accurately diagnosing. History, history, history will provide us a lot of the answers um, and therefore really finding it only necessary to jump to testing when there is a history of a reaction. Um, and just remind yourselves that that immunotherapy is not a cure. It is only a desensitization effect, whether it's for food or for environmental allergens and even for venom. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions.